Pog is a nonprofit organization that brings poetry readings, particularly poetry readings by uh, artists that we might consider experimental or out or in some way sort of considering or, or breaking uh, uh, against the sort of uh, typical ideologies um, that we expect in our current moment. POG has been organizing things since 1996, and um, we are still going strong. Um, we have a whole slate of readers coming up um, in the spring. On February 4th, on Zoom, we're going to have Joy Ladin and Trace Peterson come, uh, well, venture in via the ether. Um, on March 18th, which is the third Saturday of March, excuse me, I skipped one. On February 18th, which is the third Saturday of February, uh, the poet Lytle Shaw and Raquel Gutierrez are going to be reading. Um, on March 18th, which is the third Saturday of March, uh, Hank Laser and Charles Alexander and Tinny Nathanson will be reading. And on March 25th, Rodrigo Toscano will be reading. So lots of stuff coming up that Pog is organizing. We're so glad that you're here. Hope you all can come and participate in many things in the future. Um, we are, of course, a nonprofit organization. Thank you for contributing at the door. Of course, we're always uh, uh, welcoming other donors and contributions, uh, including um, help. You know, if you want to think about uh, coming and volunteering with Pog, we are happy to accept you. So come and talk to any of us afterwards. Um, we, of course, have to acknowledge the help of the Arizona Council for the Arts, who contributes a lot through grants to us, as well as poets and writers. Um, POG, we strive to make it a safe space, a place where um, everyone feels welcomed and has a, a, a good time. If you do not feel that that has happened, please talk to one of the POG board members who are raising their hands right now. They could be over there. Welcome again, um, our reading with Rachel Galvin, Sarah Sams, and Daniel Brzezinski will start. Um, right before that, I also want us to acknowledge that we in Tucson are living on the ancestral homelands of the Tohono O'odham and Pascoyaki nations. And I ask that we all take a moment right now to consider how we came here as well as the complicated history and the possible futures of this place. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm now going to turn it over to Johanna Skidger. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. Thank you um, for waiting. Um, we, are, we have a lineup of three wonderful poets tonight. Um, I'm going to start uh, by introducing uh, Daniel Brzezinski. And uh, Daniel comes to us um, from Chicago, poet and translator in Chicago, whose uh, most recent book um, is Written After a Massacre in the Year 2018. His 2016 collection, The Performance of Becoming Human, received the National Book Award. In 2018, Lake Michigan was a finalist for the Griffin International Poetry Prize. He's also a uh, um, a very accomplished and celebrated translator. His most recent translation is Paula Yabaka Nunez's The Loose Pearl, which came out just last year in 2022. His translation of Galo Gigliotto Valdivia, the, I, I, I don't think I did that correctly, <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, he received, uh, that, the translation of that book received the 2017 National Translation Award. He's also translated collections by Raul Zorita and uh, Jaime Luis Menun. He teaches English and Latin American and Latino studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago, but he's here tonight, so please welcome Daniel Barzutsky. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Johanna and John, for having us. Uh, sorry that we're late, we're like driving around roads and like through that like video game out there. <laughs> um, and we, 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 we made it. Um, but it's, uh, it's so nice to be here. Uh, so I'm going to read from um, just new work that um, is going to be in a book that will come out next year called The Murmuring Grief of the Americas. I'll read um, three or four poems. This is called Apparatus Number 519. 
part of the whole, the dead, the corpse, the foot, the light, the flesh, the wage, the worker, the regulator, the lie in the code of the body. It broke on the edge of itself. I did not know what I knew was true, that my eyes were blank, that my face was blank, that my bone was blank, that my body was owned by the shareholders, that my body was just meat now, that the body was just dead now, that time death was murmuring so loud and I could only hear the dead rain, the squeak, the buzz, the machine, the breath, the hatred, the fumble, the finger, the blow, the key, the sun, the brain, the bubbling, the cooling, the box, the space, the fold, the silence, the plank. I dropped all my capital in the supermarket. I was a young language with no verbs. I saw my stitches photographed from the inside. The police touched me frankly, so directly. They took me to the mask, the shield, the armor, the stone that's placed on the grave, the body that's left in the ground, the mountain they moved to the city, the beach that sunk in the city, the river that lost its water, the lake that lost its waves, the missing horizon, the missing halo, the children that disappeared into the face of time, the tower, the fire, the prose, the sticks, the woods, the foreclosed mountain we climbed before they threw us into another Wednesday, another Tuesday, another Monday. It is cruel to pray out loud, cruel to pray to a God who loves so discriminately cruel to eat in public, cruel to sing when your neighbors can't speak, moan, or whisper to the birth that refuses to drop, the death that refuses to rattle, the leg that refuses paralysis. Trust the hammer but lose the nail. Have faith in the hour but not the minutes. Don't speak the failed word, the wound word, if it's witness to the frozen, the frosted, the fickle, the inspected, the inspector, the hopeful, the hopeless, the crumbling, the growing, the decaying, the rooting, the sowing, the consuming, the fluid, the formal, the industrious, the callous, the lazy, the blank at the moment of blank be empty again. Disguise your breath. Disguise the sponge that sops up the water. Disguise the body that destroys its bones, the body that fears its own fingers, the concrete flesh, the privatized flesh, the bank flesh, the murmuring flesh, the murmuring blankness, the exhaustion, the suffering, the numbing, the weathering. I remember honey, but it's gone now. I remember seeds, but we have so few now. I remember the grass and the beach and the river, the bees and the ice, the lake and the mountain and its brokers, its board members, its collateral, its assets, its insurance, its expansion, its reduction. We cataloged the glaciers before they disappeared. We returned the earth to the investors, the anxiety to the anxious, the babies to the umbilical cords, the blood to the state and the bank. attempt at understanding economics. Um, <laughs> sustainable growth. In the strange crowds, in the hungry village, on the subway platform, in the history of the lyric, there are corpses everywhere. There are murderous cops everywhere. There are Uber drivers everywhere. Corpses everywhere. In 2011, it cost $188 to produce an iPhone. The iPhone sold for $599. The profit margin was 69%. No one saw how the desert, wor how, no one saw how the workers were chained along the stretch of desert road. They weren't corpses yet, but the bones of their cousins were scattered in the sand. The profit margin per iPhone decreased 6% between 2011. between 2011 and 2017, yet overall revenues increased 200% because of a dramatic increase in production. There's a dead body in the dumpster behind the dry cleaners. There's a bouncing coyote in the dumpster behind the television station. There's a time for cooling down, and when the cop knocks on my door and asks me for my number, I identify myself, and he says, why did you shelter the body? And then he sang a song that began with a conditional continued in the subjunctive, ended with an imperative, an unanswerable question, an insult, a beating. The bed is not a place for peace. There are bodies under the bed. There are children hiding with the bodies under the bed. Dead dogs, the history of our reproduction, the history of the skin they ripped from our arms, 
the dead skin that fell from our hands, of the gunk in our eyeballs, of our hair follicles. We can analyze the corpses by talking about the circulation of capital, interest on loans, the social relationship of labor, the relationship between money and value, the regulation and deregulation of markets, the love between user and operating system about which so many romantic comedies are now made. Or we could talk about murder. It's indecent to ask why one man is so rich when another is so poor. Private property sustains itself while creating dead bodies and inciting the revolution of the proletariat. Unmelodious sentence. The white fathers are disenfranchised. Their corpses in the white fathers' closets. The average retailer makes a 400. Pro the average retailer makes a 400% profit on a dead body. It doesn't cost very much to make a dead body in countries without unions or labor regulations. To get back to a 3% growth rate, which most economists argue is necessary for sustainable capitalism, we will need to destroy ourselves and the planet and the fathers and the sisters and the earth and the sea and the dolphins and the political frameworks of the global south and the overdeveloped north and the underdeveloped east. If we need to use violence to save the planet from total global destruction at the hands of unregulated capitalism, then here, take this baseball bat and smash some windows, please, saying the president of the World Bank to the labor union. The revolution had already been commodified, but what had yet to be accomplished was the funding of a legitimate resistance movement to be built up, then obliterated by the state and its financiers. My neighbor retired with no pension, and now he eats rotten vegetables from the dumpster. He left his house one morning and forgot to wear his shoes. He forgot to wear his socks. He forgot to wear his pants. He forgot to wear his shirt, and he forgot to wear his coat. I'm sorry, he told his children when they found him with hypothermia near the river. I will never be human again. All right, I'm going to read this, the, the like one I'm most scared to read. I don't know how long it takes. It's not going to be like 43 minutes. It might be like five or six. Uh, but, but you never know. <laughs> Um, performance of Becoming Human, number 418. Excuse me, sir, what time is the massacre? Welcome to the Air Breath Death Theater. Here we are in the Air Breath Death Theater. I drone away at my life in the Air Breath Death Theater. I drone away at my breath in the air breath death theater. The episodes blast up like birds. The critics like a coup of the imagination. The critics there to kill the coup of the imagination. The flowers fall flat on my head and the invisible body flings them from the gallery of the air breath death theater. I am dead in the morning of the air breath death theater. I am flat in the morning and there are so many books falling in the air breath death theater. They fall across the bodies of the dead. There are deserts in the mouths of the forgotten audience members in the Air Breath Death Theater. The mouths are like reduced mouths. We try to forget when we see the story of our breath moving backwards in the Air Breath Death Theater. The translation of our breath moving from side to side against the bodies that backtrack into the backstory of a back life, a backbeat, a refusal to move, a refusal to translate, a refusal to make the breath knowable from one body to another, from one tongue to another, from one nation to another. The performance of becoming less human in the air breath death theater. Aquí no hay epifanios, aquí hay puro silencio y los cuerpos caen y caen. The movement from human to less human, from humane to more humane is not graspable. It runs mouth to mouth, it runs breath to breath, death to death, it boils and runs and blooms and dies and forgets and revenges and robs and runs and boils and runs and grows. It forgets and revenges and we, the performers in the air breath death theater, build a life inside the ceremony of refusal. The ceremony that begins with the little village wiping bomb blast, the bombast, the bombed ast, the bomb in the bottom of history, la bomba en el culo del mundo, the body and the shame mouth of history, la bomba en la boca del cuerpo solitario, and the shaking hands and the exploding bodies, the death performers run with fear, they run with frenzy, they air breath death into an unspoken desire to reunite the self with the self, 
the self with the other self, the face with the other face, the grief with the collective grief, the shame with the collective shame. Desapareció la piña, desapareció el aguacate, las abejas desaparecieron, no hay un horizonte sobre el lago, no hay agua en el noche de petróleo. Shame, how it dots the map, a colonial of a, a colony of imperial dung. It dots the map, it is a colony of imperial dung, flung from the mountain, moaning in the middle of the city, in the middle of the empire, in the middle of the shame mouth, in the middle of the air breath death theater. This is the road that leads to the air breath death theater. This is the road that hides a forgotten massacre. Una gramática dolorosa no se mira en la boca. It is the road, it hides a future forgotten massacre. It is the road, it hides a resurrection. It is a road, it hides the buckling of the earth, the break of the pavement, the collapsing of the highway is a road, it hides a future massacre within a past massacre. Is that a body or a mountain? It hides a resurrection in the collective grief of the faces in the crowd. Excuse me, sir, what time is the massacre? No tengo confianza en esta traducción. They look blank. They are performing the mountainness of the mountain. The bodies in the air breath death theater trying to become the eternal embarrassment of nature. The disappearance of the most beautiful, miserable valley has been captured in the faces of the audience at the air breath death theater. The captured orangutan turns human when none of the captors are looking. The audience members come to watch the disappearance of their own bodies. They look out on the massacre road and see their bodies evaporating. A documentarian photographs their faces stuck in the mountain. The economists celebrate the macroscopic potential of the animal's human transformation. The audience members are stuck in the resurrection of the collective grief. By the river, the families weep blaze with grief shame. And the voice sings backwards, I like the air breath death theater because it absorbs me. I like the air breath death theater because it spits me out into a reduction of blankness, a reduction of epiphany, an innovation of extermination, a reduction of massacre, an innovation of resurrection, a reduction of performance, an innovation of extermination, a reduction of epiphany, a reductness, a reduction in the blankness of blank. And I'll read one last piece. Thank you so much for listening. Um, um, this is called Disaster Exposure. I was reading a lot about um, hedge funds and um, their um, relationship to disaster. And I, uh, this is sort of based on a finance essay about how the ways in which um, whether or not hedge funds actually profit from disasters. And it wasn't like ironic at all. It was like um, economists actually trying to figure out whether or not they should, uh, whether this is a good economic practice. Um, and basically it is, uh, was the um, analysis that it is profitable, disasters are profitable. Disaster exposure, which is the term for when your hedge fund has exposure to disaster. Disaster exposure. You ask him if his hedge fund has sufficient exposure to disaster and he whispers, I could really use a hurricane to deliver superior fund performance. What do you see that other people cannot see? Everything in this poem is on the surface. There is no subtext or subtext to the subtext. The words only mean what I want them to mean. I am not so interested in the imagination, and I am more than capable of exploiting disaster concerns to deliver superior fund performance. Tell the story a different way. The doctor says, patient cannot tell the difference between what he is and what he owes. Describe the aesthetics of the disaster. Every collapsing system is a poem in itself. Lucky for me, I am paid by the word to write it. You ask him if his disaster risk is heterogeneous, and he says, all you need is a touch of disaster exposure, and you will see a beautiful increase in the returns on your fear premium. But seriously, boss, how bad does it have to be before we can call it a disaster? How broken does your body need to be before we can call it a disaster? He dithers, she dithers, they dither, this is dithering. Tell the story a different way. The interest in your body is the origin of your world. It all begins with a credit default swap, a complex financial product whose name sounds like a natural mineral, baby. I love it when you say, superior fund performance. <laughs> Let's do some quick math on the back of this envelope. There are hundreds of lost bodies and thousands of lost limbs. Are they enough? The river is in the wrong place again. Is that enough? 
The highway is hanging from the mountains again. Is that enough? The mountains are covered with rooftops. The electric pole has been in the middle of the road for so long that people have confused it for a work of art. But and. The disaster that surrounds us is not really a disaster, but and. You begin with debt and you end with debt. And when there is no debt, you don't know what to do because all you have ever known is debt. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, um, it's my pleasure now to welcome Sarah Sams um, to the stage here. Um, to many of you, I think she needs no introduction, though she's really been in Tucson only for a handful of years now. We're lucky enough um, to have her here. Um, she comes to us from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, originally uh, got her MFA at ASU and now is assistant professor um, of creative writing in, uh, of English in, um, at the University of Arizona. And uh, she is also has received teaching fellowships from the Ministry of Education of Spain and the National University of Singapore. And in a comment that I think is really wonderfully uh, appropriate um, for this for this event with three masterful poets and translators. She believes that all poetry is an act of translation. And this is a belief um, that she holds fast to in her role as the poetry editor for identity theory. And um, she's uh, gonna be reading, I don't know, maybe from her book, uh, Adam City, uh, tonight. And, uh, and this is a book that, in the words of Cynthia Hogue, uh, is a book of exploratory poems from the vast archive of the Adams, as well as tender poems of loss and love. She also Hogue calls um, this a bold debut for a major new poet. And we're lucky to have um, Sarah sharing that work with us tonight. Welcome, Sarah. Daniel, you said something, I think one of the phrases from your last poem was the innovation of extermination. And that might as well have been the billboard of my hometown. <laughs> and now I have a like, perfect economic follow-up to that poem, some books to sell about growing up there. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'll read a few poems um, from Adam City and then a few new poems. I know that like maybe I should be careful about time. This is 10, 15, so good. Or we all we all doing good out there? Okay. Making sure because there's more bombs and grief coming. Um, this is called. But think, are you authorized to tell it? And the, that phrase actually was taken from a billboard from Oak Ridge, where time Oak Ridge. I didn't know the secret we kept when I lived in the town where quiet vines thread trees in winter. Now I visit every year to see the trumpet creeper gone brown and the kudzu like dead party streamers. And today there was a squirrel eyeing me from his side the way a squirrel must. <laughs> he clattered on the roof and called for me to speak more plainly, so I'll shoot for pared down, a small phrase to hold and turn over. A coin with two sides, cool and smooth and seductive, like security. You could bite the coin to test the secret or lay it on an eye as you sleep just for the quality of the image. Electrons dance inside metal like dreams. Walking deep through Greenway Trail, I listen to the story of Tsutomu who made it home from Nagasaki to Hiroshima after one white flare, and time to see the second. Then I sit on a root shiny with sap from a higher wound, tooth down on what I meant to share with you. The hard coin whirs against my tongue. I don't believe I've ever been quiet just because I was told. Prophecy after heartbreak, after John Hendricks, who foresaw the atom bomb in 1902. She left me and I missed being touched. That's the reason I went barefoot through the woods. Bare feet give one the sense of being intimate. The dirt tickled me, a speck of oak lodged between my toes. Then I saw two streams run out in opposite directions, though they laid beside each other. This struck me, called to me like my long gone wife. Listen here, the stream said. Listen better. 
If I say, God, how the earth of her would shake, you figure I'm prone to exaggerate. But you're imagining our love now, which is good. It's what people forget. You can call God love if you like. I laid down because I missed her and because desire is a kind of God, we all know that. When the ground kept whispering, I pressed an ear down. Of course I called it God. By now you know that men around these parts will do that. Hear a woman's breath from deep within and say, it's godlike. Which is the point. Listen better. I listened so long I got hungry, like when we used to lie all day in bed. And in that state I dreamed, listening, listening. I could hear what was brewing here, the seed of disease, the sound both strange and close to home, as my belly rumbles in a fight. And in the rumbling I heard, yes, the pounding down of railroad ties, and yes, the rushed up factories for the bomb. I think I had the word for bomb. How they'd enlist all this I've said as platform for their story. All, here John saw the atom split, and here John spoke God's plan. But I was trying to say, I hear you. I was trying to say, come back home now. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of research as I was writing this book, and a, a lot of archival research, and also a lot of reflecting on the atrocities of, of the nuclear bombs, um, you know, like, after which there are hamburgers named in local cafes in my hometown. Um, and. During the middle of writing the book, uh, my father died. That was the universe's way of being like, grief is not an intellectual pursuit, Sarah. Um, so, you know, it helped me finish the book, that grief. Um, and I'm gonna read a few poems that kind of veer into that terrain, if I can find them. Here's, this is a weird prose poem. It's called, This Bit Here Could Go. You'd see my restlessness if you were to catch me, leering at myself in the bathroom. Not like she who tucked her thigh into a canister of tights and plastered her waist and shaped herself into a handle. There's no sexual pout staring back at me as I look for the dimple's dimple, the twitching glute. I think I might be entering a dissociative state, and I have to say, it's fucking thrilling. <laughs> When I struggle to find the words to explain, Rachel helps, gives me ambivalent, and she's right, this bit here could go, whatever. Maybe because lipids kept my father's heart from reaching the potential of its emblem, his symbology, which held me three decades of small and large despairs. I was in the young when the slow descent inside him started without notice. Was there a parade of color leaving? Merlot to sherry to blush to salmon grayed at the edge. Did it happen as I found my way to the stadium seats, eager to watch the game? I would like to Google congestive heart failure and try to faint. That'd knock me out of this reverie, wouldn't it? Instead, I bulge and pull at myself, making me think of the baguette I'd been eating, roasted chicken with a piquant honey mustard. What warmth it brought to my belly, how badly I needed that warmth just then. For the stadium mouth opened up to an endless fog, un ciel de fumé d'argent, and I had walked a long way and missed my father. I remember the sky that night exactly as I found it in a French poem, one year later, after he was gone. Sort of a, a gazelle, but it's called decayed gazelle, and it took its own, took its own journey. The law of conservation of parity was wrong. Chen Cheng proved so. The men she proved so for won the Nobel Prize for Chen Cheng. A novelty calendar teaches me her name. She helped us fuel the bomb and understand decay. Inherently likable in its cobalt furs, Chen Cheng's beta decay says scintillator, and yet stays far away from issues of consent. Conservation of parity, trust in nature to be symmetrical, in agreement with itself. How like a mime you raise your glass and I raise mine. 
how in the mirror I'm berating myself, berating myself uniformly. Only resumed way in now, and I never took physics. I always wanted my head spun round in other ways. But now I want to know, is there a problem to chew on so tasty I might, to my very last, doubt? I want to see my mouth still puckering, cosmological constant, a candy in my mouth, before two chalkboard balls that bob the thought of particles. Don't they look like surly clowns? I think they would laugh if they could at their jumbo size, their chalky solidity, at my funny little need to know, and me plumbing me still up until the very last. So I thought I'd just read a few new poems. Um, I can't say that they're more uplifting, but I'm excited about them. Um, they're all titled Postpartum Psychology, one, two, and three. The nurses knew what to do with an infant. They eddied around us in mission linen while I, a stupid succulent, tried to absorb their intuition. Then the nurses brought me sleep, taking my daughter to be cleaned, and a landscape of horror reeled, all primordial shit, a fox decaying on time-lapse repeat, fungi spreading like infection, making it impossible to breathe. I couldn't stop the show and somehow knew it wasn't one, what the nurses' training taught, how easily we stroll through our days, forgetting. Two. Forgetting is easy. What's a sonnet? How many lines? How many days spent defending your thesis? What kind of rhyme? What texture were your dreams back then? And what other forms have dissolved since? I do remember the stale Catalinas, what static was framed by the waiting room windows. The room gleamed monochrome and the mountains persisted, both of them harsh in their whispers. You and here, she does. I'm gone already, I thought, afraid to hope she'd continue to be. And I can't help but tasting that word they had me sign, emergency, but see the smaller room they brought us to as a pod used to insulate grief. But then the surgeon sighed, showed us her box of mysteries. Three. The closed box her surgeon held out like a treat, as if to show us what we did not see. A rib retractor, total opening, three inches. Baby mixture scissors. Scalpel specialized in bringing her to strawberry hearts. My daughter's stomach a fig. Her diaphragm chrysalis thin. Today my daughter digs for rocks she needs in a recipe of her own invention. She turns when I yell, surprised by bluish knobs growing from a tree I thought I had wasted water on. Figs! I say because figs, unripe and unsweet, but figs, real figs, newly visible on the leafless vines. In two weeks, we plan to move, so I tear some off, take them in, open them, just to see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And um, you have to say, I think, an um, excellent segue with those uh, new poems. Um, to um, our final reader for tonight, um, Rachel Galvin, who I met in an airport um, many years ago now, and I've been waiting since that time for our past to cross again. So I'm happy that it's tonight. Uh, Rachel Galvin's recent poetry collection um, is Utrotopia, and uh, she has copies here tonight. It's very recent, just out um, like a couple weeks ago, right? Um, this month, um, published by Persia Books. And she is also the author of Elevated Threat Level, which I think there's copies of as well. There's copies, um, by the way, of all three of uh, the poet's um, books here tonight. So do check out the book table um, after the reading. Um, she is a finalist for the National Poetry Series. And, uh, oh, sorry. The Elevated, Ele uh, Elevated Threat Level was a, f a finalist for the National Poetry Series. And Pulleys and Locomotion. Her translations include Raymond Cuneau's Hitting the Streets, which was winner of the 2014 Scott Moncrief Prize, and Oliverio Gerondo's Decal's Complete Early Poetry, and a finalist for the 2018 National Translation Award. 
Her work appears in journals and anthologies, including the Best American Experimental Writing from 2020, Best American Poetry 2020, Bennington Review, Boston Review, McSweeney's, The Nation, New Yorker, Plowshares, and Poetry, to name only um, a selection of, um, uh, of the outlets. So she's a co-founder also of Utrenspo, and do I have that pronunciation right? Like Ulapo, only Utrenspo is fabulous. Um, so it, that's an international creative translation collective. Um, so please join me in welcoming Rachel Gavin. Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us, Joanna and John, and sorry we all made you wait, and we were so lost. <laughs> Fried and Susan had to like steer us in on speakerphone, so I'm glad we found you in the end. Cecilia, thank you for coming tonight. I'm really happy to see you here, to see you. Um, I'm going to read some poems from this new book. Yeah, it's fresh out. It's fresh out. Two weeks ago, you know how strange it is you work on something for a long time and then you give birth to it and it becomes something separate from you, right? Um, Sarah, your postpartum poems are so powerful. I'm, yeah, I want to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to start with a poem called Little Death. Little Death. When a man traps a fish, he removes the hook from its side, and once it has beaten its fright into the wooden boat with its slaps, he will clutch the fish to his chest and hold it as it struggles. He will hold it in the tender air. He will hold its tail as if it were his dance partner's waist and gaze into the fish's face for minutes. When a man seizes a fish, he soothes it, caresses its body tip to tip while it thrashes bloody against his bare chest. He will clasp the fish with one hand like a newborn and hush its gasping with the other. With love, he will tuck it under his chin so he can feel its heartbeat in the insistent heat that hangs above the water. Remember, when a man captures a fish, he will seduce it while he slaughters it. The strength of his love can't be simulated. The sound of his green water of the green water can't be simulated. He will kiss the wheezing gills. His kisses can't be simulated. He will hold it as it struggles, that little death. He will hold it in the tender air. So this uh, poem is called Red Armor, and it's in honor of Cecilia Vicuña, who's here tonight, presente, and uh, her, uh, you will recognize her in the last stanza of the poem. Red Armor, so this one's for you. A man crafts the smallest sushi in the world from one grain of rice, a tiny piece of nori wrapped around a shred of sea urchin. He says a woman cried for over an hour when she saw the small sushi. It was just so cute. <laughs> the ratio indicating the relation of the duration of weeping to the size of the sushi is bewildering. Sometimes I can't tell if my neighbor upstairs is crying. As I listen to her outpouring, I try to discern whether it's giddy giggling or lament. I change my mind every few minutes. Her state of excitement is perhaps both. She must wonder this about me too sometimes. Should you punch a Nazi, yes or no? Should you punch a girl sitting at a bar, yes or no? If you're the girl sitting at the bar, will you laugh when you tell the story about how a guy you didn't even know walked up and punched you? I turn over my lipstick and look at the label. All this time, I had been reading Red Amour as Red Armor. <laughs> this is true. I suppose that more than, ar than Amour, I needed armor on my mouth. If you're the girl sitting at the bar, should you punch the guy back? In the 1960s, the Viet Cong guerrilla girls who came to visit Chile looked like angels, say the artist, says the artist whose glasses read Verdad. Some were snipers or officers, some were spies. Around here, you can't make a sound without someone seeing it. Uh, 
Um, so I wrote a series of poems for this book called Corpse Pose, like Shavasana in yoga, so Corpse Pose. And in the end, there's two in the book that are both named Corpse Pose. This is one of them. Um, and again, everything in this poem is true. Everything I'm going to say tonight is true. <laughs> Poets only tell the truth, right? <laughs> Corpse Pose. Pretend you are dead. And we will eat you, my four-year-old nieces insist. I lie still and close my eyes. <laughs> Pretend that you're really dead. They make munching sounds, yum, 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 while pretending to eat my torso. Then S grabs her doll, saying, I'm going to eat this baby, yum, 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 yum. At night, I look into the mirror and whisper, hello, baby. Pretend you are dead and begin chewing. At the Hyewon Healing Center in South Korea, you can practice your own death in the company of others. Write your own obituary and give it a trial run among candles and chrysanthemums. You may say prayers, put on a yellow or white burial shroud, and the envoy from the other world will nail you into a casket for 10 dark minutes. You may photograph yourself with your coffin. When M's parents brought him for a grave viewing in Rockaway Beach so he could admire their fine vista and see his own grave with a view, he waited until his parents had just faded from view and then pissed on his own grave with gusto. An 800-year-old churchyard reclines under the rotting apples in Oliver's orchard. Toddlers grab green, yellow, red apples with glee. A wanton bite here, toss it away. A bite there, toss it away. Child becomes apple, becomes child. The young doctor jokes, we're going to put you in the juicing machine. We'll make Fred juice. How about that? We'll drink you up. To which five-year-old Fred replies, I'm not an apple, but we all know he is. The Met was evacuated when Roger threw ashes white as anthrax into the orchestra pit. Ashes, he later said, were the remains of a friend whom he wanted to scatter within the houses of music so he could listen forever, a tender dismemberment as remembrance with the Met as ninth stop on his opera tour. T trying to lighten the mood, I told Terry they would never be able to vacuum all of him up. Twice today, I've seen squirrel carcasses mashed into the ground by cars, fur like small flags, grave markers. It's the 11th year of the war against the drug cartels. At least 150,000 people have died. A girl paints a second mouth made of marigolds on the side of her face. Decapitated, disappeared, buried in clandestine graves, thrown in garbage dumps. Only chins and hair visible, women wearing skeleton masks march in remembrance of the six women killed every day near Juarez, reduced to ashes, drowned in sewage canals. The lady who cuts the umbilical cord watches over their bones. My four-year-old nieces are playing with a doll they call Aunt Sophia. Aunt Sophia falls off the third floor story balcony and says, Ouch. She's taken to the hospital and receives new legs, new arms, and a new head. Aunt Sophia falls off the balcony again and falls off the balcony and falls off. Aunt Sophia falls off the balcony again, and the lady who cuts the umbilical cord watches over her bones. next poem is called, Well, No One Ever Said Breeding Was Easy. <laughs> well, No One Ever Said Breeding Was Easy. And it's a, um, um, an abecedarian poem. So each line starts A, B, C. And then it's braided, so it also goes backwards. So it goes A, Z, B, Y, C, X. You get the idea. <clears throat> well, No One Ever Said Breeding Was Easy. Attempts for years to have a child, gives up, adopts a child, and gets pregnant. Zipping your lips is what they call it when you pretend it doesn't hurt. Budgets for four rounds of IVF has three miscarriages and one healthy baby. You should just adopt, people say. 
ceases taking depression meds so as to conceive and grows suicidal. X-rays are what they call it when they squirt you full of iodine to check your tubes. Felix is playing the chorus to this poem. <laughs> Delivers a stillborn baby and then miscarries. Wage gap is what they call it when women make 77 cents for every dollar earned by men. Eclampsia is what they call the seizures that land her in the hospital in the eighth month. Visa officers block pregnant women at the border for fear of what they call anchor babies. Freezes six embryos just in case and then gets pregnant by accident. Uterine cancer is what they call it when you're exposed to toxic chemical waste. Geriatric mother is what the doctors call you when you're pregnant over 35. Transvaginal probes are what they put inside you when you seek an abortion in 27 states. It's probably more now. I wrote this before the fall of Roe v. Wade. Has an abortion, has an abortion, has a miscarriage. Senile vaginitis is what the doctors call it when you're in menopause. I lost at least one book, maybe one and a half, to raising my kids, she says. Runs a marathon while bleeding freely, blood staining her leggings. Just home from the hospital with her newborn when her wife leaves her. Quits her job, drops off each kid with a different relative and drives away. Keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying. Pregnancy wastage is what they write on her chart, meaning her baby is stillborn. Laughs out loud when she discovers she is pregnant at 50. Other women are her main source of information about what to do. Married for 15 years and can't convince her husband to have a child. Not expecting her period, she wads up toilet paper in her panties but still bleeds through. Never wanted to have kids and is now a stepmother to three. Mother makes her sleep in the cow shed until her period is over. Ovaries are hyperstimulated by IVF drugs and she gains 15 pounds in one week. Luxury items are how tampons and pads are classified for taxation in 33 states. Pretends everything's just swell as she miscarries during a job interview. Keeps quiet when people call him the mother even though he birthed their baby after transitioning. Questions her choice to have a child to strangers in bars for years. Jails and prisons in the U.S. force women to work 21 hours for a box of pads, 27 hours for a box of tampons. Resolves to have a baby on her own and meets a partner, a new partner, while seven months pregnant. Incompetent cervix or inadequate pelvis is what they like to say to lay the blame on you. Suffers the loss of one twin in utero and the second stays in intensive care for a year. Hostile uterus is what they call it when your body blocks sperm like a champ. I also think it'd be a really good name for like a punk band, but hostile uterus. Hostile uteri, make it plural. <laughs> Tells no one she's pregnant, not even her partner, until the abortion is over. Good news, it hurts like hell, but I swear you won't even remember it after. Used a donor egg and smiles every time someone says her son looks like her. Fair practice is what they call it when she doesn't get promoted because they suspect she might have another child. Vacuuming the eggs out of her ovaries leaves her aching when she wakes. Exhausted by people mistaking her for the nanny because she and her son don't have the same skin color. Why don't you just adopt, people ask. Decides to give up her newborn for adoption because she wants to finish high school. X-rays of her fallopian tubes hurt more than expected returning after to work after the procedure. C-sections mean the doctor gets paid more and they're in and out in an hour. You should just think about adopting, people advise. Buys food but no tampons this month because she's too broke. Zygotes are overrated, says her friend with no kids. Adoption isn't an option. She can't opt to adopt because she's broke. Too broke. She's broke. So I'm going to read a poem called One Sugar or Two, and um, I've been thinking a lot about what's been going on, what's happened in California the shootings the last few days. 
one sugar or two. In Chicago, urban farmers have such a surplus of eggs, they don't even barter, they just give them away. On the table is served a Dutch baby, made of six eggs, eight tablespoons of butter, a little flour, a little milk, a pinch of nutmeg, a Dutch baby. Right out of the oven, give me a piece of that baby, she says. Put some hot sauce on that baby, he says. I'm reminded of a man in Vermont pulling a stillborn sheep out from its moaning mother. The one born alive has cords wrapped around it, spindly legs that seem impossible, but within a week the lamb is playing king of the mountain atop a heap of dung. Sheepskin on the sofa, sheepskin on the floor. I think of my friend's poem about the futility of writing poems about birthing animals, about pulling anything from death into life. Kids before guns, the teenager yells into the mic to a crowd of half a million at the Capitol. A gun without bullets is sold out of a truck for 200 bucks to pay for dinner. With bullets, you could afford dessert. We don't actually need assault weapons to kill deer, a child hunter comments. This morning, high school students across the country walked out to protest gun violence, while at the same moment, a man walked into a Florida high school and shot a student. In Florida, almost all manatees bear scars from boat propellers. One is nicknamed No Tail. Everyone is especially sad when a boat kills a manatee that has what they call a milk-dependent baby. I'm not here to lighten the mood either. <laughs> that was another book. Tender commodities. Tender commodities. People migrate by crowded bus or by crowded car. People cling to a freight train or an inflatable raft. No blankets, no diapers, no pads, no formula, no food. People travel by foot and travel by night and they wait. A boy falls off a freight car and breaks both arms. People wait in encampments for their children, and they wait. Caged children's bodies are wrapped in mylar like tender commodities, like bags of chips, like hand grenades. They wait for frozen cheese sandwiches as snow falls like ash. They wait all day to play in a fenced-in courtyard, while around the block, the restaurants keep filling with people and emptying and filling, and I think about the work it takes to prepare those meals and serve them. Crops grown, produce picked, food shipped, linens bleached, tables bust, credit cards charged, a weary swirl of finance crowds around the waist. So many items, so many items, so very many items and items. I think about who's making, who's buying, who's using all the items, tender commodities like the bodies of detained children. Children sleep in a retail store cuddled by ghost commodities, nestled in rows upon rows of chain link fence, fluorescent lights, all day, all night, agents and cameras, and agents and cameras, and bed pads on the concrete, and bed pads on the concrete, and wet wipes and wet wipes and wet wipes instead of showers, and bags of chips, and bags of chips, and bags of chips, and bags of chips. So uh, one thing about this book that I'm really happy about is the cover painting from a friend of mine whose name is Vera Ilyatova. She's a Russian-American painter. Um, and we've known each other for more decades than I care to count. Um, and I've tried to write in conversation with her work for a long time and sort of tried and failed. And, um, a number of the poems in this book were actually inspired by looking at some of her paintings. Um, and there's one based on the cover painting. Um, I, it, was, it was a really big deal to me to ask her if, if I could have permission to put the painting on the cover. I felt like I was asking her to prom. I was like, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, she said yes. So, um, you know, and then I, I want the book to like be up to the standard of her, because I'm so envious of people who can work in visual arts, right? Who can paint and who can make installations and sculptures and have this immediacy of sensory experience and the body's relationship to the work. And I wish I could do that with language, right? I feel like I'm always striving for that and fail and then keeping on writing and striving. So uh, this is a poem dedicated to my friend Vera. It's called Fine Arts. It's also after W.H. Auden's poem that you might be familiar with, Musée de Beaux-Arts. It's 
called Fine Arts. About women, she's never wrong, the young painter. How well she understands their predicament, how they must resemble bright red poppies, while someone else watches them eat, or take off their coat, or just walk down the street. How, when the old men are passionately waiting for them to bend and reveal their cleavage, there must always be girls who are still children, who did not at all want it to happen, strolling by a pond at the edge of a wood. She never forgets that it keeps on happening anyway in a corner, some humdrum place, where men get on with their lives and their locker room pranks, scratching their balls and the ears of devoted dogs. In Vera Ilyatova's Softly Softly, for instance, how two girls grab hands and turn away when they see the body lying in blood. A third in a blue scarf may have heard the screaming or heard the silence after, but she didn't know what to do. The sun went on shining as it had to on the girls disappearing into the grass, disappearing into the river, disappearing into the desert, and the indigo blur of a neck elegantly turned away belonged to someone who might have seen something but had things to do and went on with their day. So I'll just read two things in closing. Uh, the work of Ansel Kiefer, who uh, is a German artist who struggled with the legacy of World War II in Germany um, in paintings and installations. Um, and uh, uh, the poem has a, an epigraph um, from Cesar Vallejo, the great Peruvian poet. Cesar Vallejo, best poet of the 20th century, maybe. Uh, um, it, translated by Valentino Januzzi, the Peruvian poet, and the Irish poet Michael Smith. And the epigraph goes like this. The graveyards were bombed and the immortal dead of vigilant bones and everlasting shoulder. On their graves, the immortal dead on feeling, seeing, hearing, so low the evil, so dead the vile aggressors, resumed their unfinished mourning. And Cesar Vallejo wrote that about the Spanish Civil War in the late 1930s, but I was thinking about this again. Uh, with Russia uh, bombing Ukraine, bombing the shit out of all of Ukraine, and even the cemeteries, even the dead are being bombed. It's called resistance, with a, with a backdrop of um, burbling children, so resistance. On the bed, a stain in the shape of a state, or a city. No, it's shaped like a small town that belongs to one country invaded by another country, now reclaimed by the first country, though the inhabitants never hold citizenship in any sovereign nation. The town batted back and forth, two dogs killing a mouse. Remember the bombed graveyard next door? Headstones and shards. Even the dead are not safe. The dead are not safe. They're not safe. They're not. Not the dead. The bed sits in a room filled with guilt, vinegar, rust, and shame. Vinegar, frustration, dead stalks, grayed out honeycombed heads, women made of wire. A militarized border striates the room. Grave markers drape over the lead bed. Even the dead are not safe. The dead are not safe, they're not safe, they're not, not the dead. The women who sleep in the bed build boats of rust to sail on a sea of rust amidst scum and froth, mud and lead, breathing camphor, breathing vinegar, breathing the burnt smudges where water used to be, ash, still ash, dirt encrusted in cracks, ash, boats built of rust to sail on a sea of rust, ash, words scratched in flesh, words etched where the sky had been, ash, boats laden with refuse, boats of scrap, a horizon scratched into the sky's husk, ash, waves etched in rust, ash on wire, ash on rust, water-stained scraps jut through waves of wire, waves of ash, the sea burnt and cracked, the sea needs camphor, the sea needs ash, rub camphor on the sea, its lacerations and sores, the sea is sore, so sore, the sea is sore, rust is growing, encroaching, rub camphor on the sea, blisters of the sea, So beautiful. Like, thank you. It's like a fill in the blank for the rest of the poem. <laughs> Let boats of
of ash sail on the sea of blisters. Let the boats scrape across the sea of wire, sea of rust, sea of ash. Let the boats scratch waves of wire, waves of ash. Let the boats scrape and scratch, for even the dead are not safe. The dead are not safe, they're not safe, they're not, they're not safe, not the dead. last poem I'll read to you is uh, called Meat and Honey. Uh, <clears throat> and I wrote this after seeing a, a room full of butterflies that Damien Hurst made. Um, uh, Meat and Honey. Heavy rubber curtains the doorway of a human-sized butterfly terrarium. We're instructed to proceed at a steady pace amidst insects gorging on honey. If the creatures had been house flies, they would have been hideous, reminding me of my own corpse rotting, none of the rainbow covenant that's bundled into the butterfly. What if they were small foxes or cats? Maybe their lifespan is too long, but it would make a hell of a durational piece. It's impossible to think of how many lives are happening amidst the wriggling filaments, the legs with a single claw. Impossible to think of those that have happened and ended, who are hungry, who are not at home, who are broken, who are falling right now. When I first discovered orgasms, I walked through the world in a haze, wondering why that wasn't what everyone does all day long. <laughs> How can anyone talk of anything else? <laughs> now I think the same of death. How can anyone think of anything else? I'm terribly attached to my own consciousness. I'm at home in the scaffolding of my mind, the taste of my knees, the smell of my armpits, the beats my feet keep, and those they don't, my compound eye, my proboscis. I imagine losing this. Imagine someone else passing through the rubber curtains, watching me feed on sugar, on sugar water, spin a silk mat, shrug off my exoskeleton and eat it like an edible overcoat and fall to the floor behind a trailing plant. It's devastating. And the crimson, orange, and yellow, the inexplicable gold chrysalis make a difference. Little angels, little widgets, pumping fluid into crumpled wings until they stiffen. Photographs are forbidden, but they'd be useless anyway. The point is to move and sweat, losing our signatures, like a dancer's unmistakable ankle, or how she lifts a shoulder with curiosity, as one might lift an eyebrow. My body inclines toward another. I sip the air with my tubular sucking organ. I am a question made of meat and honey. Thank you.